you you don't have a name in the film. You're just I'm just uh, a volunteer. The volunteer, yes. That's how women are sometimes. <laughs> yes. Sometimes we're not volunteers. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> you see, we, we're cornering you, so sorry. We planned it. <laughs> Uh, there's many points of entry into this film um, in terms of the way you use uh, space and the way you play with time. Uh, there's a lot of scenes that are emerging from it uh, in terms of cinematographic influences and working in the genre, but also the way you talked about uh, climate change and the way you use ecology and the way you use folk and uh, traditional folk around. So there's a lot to talk about and I've decided we're going to just talk for two hours <laughs> about <laughs> this. But one thing I was curious about maybe as a starting point, it's um, when you write a script about a film like this and because the film is so much about atmosphere and visual design and sound design uh, m more than a traditional storytelling, really. Uh, what type of script would you write and what would you share with Marie in terms of uh, giving her something to work from? The, the script is, is really sparse. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it, was, um, it was written really quickly. And I'm sure some people in the room think, yeah, no shit. <laughs> but it's... I, I try and stay away from, and Mary can talk about this more from her experience of it, but I don't, it, my scripts never include any adjectives or adverbs, so I never describe, I never suggest any anything about how the character feels, just the actions of it, and then I want the actors, in this case, mostly Mary, to kind of fill in, fill in the gaps, and they're literal gaps in the script. All of my action direction is single lines, line break. I try and get one word sentences. And if it's one word and then a full stop, it's a line break and another word with a full stop. So it's, it's very sparse. And when, when I showed it to Film 4, who funded the film, mm -hmm. they were um, they, they were like, oh, this reads like a poem. Oh. And, and I thought, well, you know, that's what, that's what I want it to feel like, really. Because um, that's like the, the highest form of art for me. If I could write better poetry, I wouldn't go to the hassle of making films. <laughs> but the, the script is, um, you know, everybody, every character that I write, and there's not many in this film, but it are, are versions of me. And so I try not to suggest any motivations or any feelings or anything for the characters because I want to hand the character over, I want to hand that character over to the actor. Um, to make it less me, to make it part me and, and part them. And if I start suggesting motivations and extensive backstory, then I think you sort of disempower the actor. And I'm a, a, I'm a um, textbook Jungian introvert. So all of my characters are introverts that I write. If I try and write an extrovert, they're awful characters. <laughs> Mary's a textbook Jungian extrovert, I hope. She doesn't mind me saying that. So I can hand over a, a blueprint of a character that's all introvert, and then she brings the extrovert side to it. Mm -hmm. She can't act it as an extrovert, obviously, but the kind of that that extrovert nature comes out in in other ways. I think in, in sometimes in in a look that you get, or sometimes from a line of dialogue. You know, we got one substantial dialogue scene in the film so it comes out there but it also just comes out in her then building a backstory from her experience as a mm -hmm. as a person who is an extrovert who who needs certain things that maybe an introvert doesn't doesn't need and so going back to your question there's a lot of gaps physically in the script but there's a lot of gaps that I that I hope the actors can can fill in to kind of make the make the characters more complex more difficult to read ultimately like you know like um like most of us are um, i hope you can uh, add to this because even so the character is, is very spare sparse like storyline and action scene you can feel how rich uh, in her interior life is and what she's doing even so i'm sure the script was like just pretty much narrative like 
walk here, be here, and yeah. nothing else. So how did Mostly you walk here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Walk back. Walk slowly, back. walk quickly. <laughs> no, I never still. give a speed. No. <laughs> That's didn't what you bring to it as an extrovert. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in, in, as your extrovert, uh, yes. as the extrovert side of Mark and you, yourself, <laughs> how yeah. did you work with with Vils to develop the character? Um, it was uh, as an extrovert um, with very little to say. It it it, it was a real challenge, um, and as a an actor and also as a person who you notice in a minute who had very physically demonstrative all the time to pare all of that down and to have to um try and convey all of it and it sort of so minimally um i did find quite hard and the scene that i have with ed uh, was just like you know you just talking about it then i just it was just so lovely to have someone else to <laughs> to, <laughs> to work with and react to and and I find the bit when um, when she says, you know, you, you should stay, and he says no, and and I find it heartbreaking really because that was that was the extrovert in me who was desperate for a bit of company and desperate for for him to stay and and for some sort of um, human contact. And and although we, you know, she's there are other people there. I I don't know, you know, sh they're not there physically f mm -hmm. for her. You have rocks, flowers, yep. and birds, uh, ghosts. And uh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's lots going on. But what um, do you need? <laughs> and a disco scene. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's it it it, it was a, it was a challenge. Yeah. There was two scenes of interaction between you and Ed because there's a, a precursor to when you're in the house, which is in the shed when you're working with the oh, yeah. trying to get the. Um, Generated, generated to start, to there was another interaction, but it was, it was too much. <laughs> <laughs> is, is it in the longer version, that the director's cut that's coming next? No, it, I think it, it doesn't. It actually doesn't. When we shot it, we shot this film, and it, it's kind of, it's almost like a bit of a physical comedy because <laughs> Mary's character is trying to start the generator, and um, Ed's character decides. You can see him make this decision where he goes, "This is a job for a man," <laughs> and so sort of steps forward. And she just sort of kills him with a look and blocks <laughs> him with her body and then starts it in one go. And he visibly just shrinks and she emasculates him with one start <laughs> of the generator. And when we shot it, everybody was like, That's a, that is amazing. What, what a scene. And, you know, let's have half an hour off and slap each other on the back about <laughs> how great we are. And then, of course, I got in the edit and thought, this is from a different film. Yeah. This just doesn't <laughs> fit at all, so no, it won't be in the director's cut. It, it may be, um, it may, it may turn up on a on a Blu-ray when we're scrabbling around for extras. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you have a lot of rehearsal, um, or you just like because you you work on 16 millimeter print uh, film, and it's there's no direct sound, I believe. So, do you? Are you able to just do a lot of take, to do a lot of, or you do a lot of rehearsal, or just like, uh, well, we gonna do this and go for it, just work with your look and your expressions? I, I, I mean, we talk about it before we run the camera, and we <laughs> w and we block it technically. And if if Mary wants to rehearse it, we will rehearse it. And you know, because Mary's sort of, you know, she's worked a lot in film and and a, and a lot in TV, but a huge amount in theatre. So what you know, where you have a huge rehearsal process so quite often you know we do rehearse it but once the camera's running it's one take mm. and then and then yeah. but then I do a technical <laughs> safety which so I call it a one take because I don't do a second take and vary it I do a second take and then do it exactly the same in case there's a fault with the camera because it's a oh. clockwork camera and all of that so yeah one I would uh, most of the time there's not a technical problem so I'm left with the spare take which I which pains me because it doesn't get used unless I can drop it in elsewhere, you know, as like a, a flash forward or a flashback. Oh, I was like in another film. Well, yeah, yeah maybe. <laughs> oh. But, you know, what, I'm g at some point, I'm going to get brave enough to go full Clint Eastwood and just one take and that's it. <laughs> um, uh, is it like, are you careful about saving the film, like the print for the 16 millimeter when you're shooting? Is it limited? Or it just As the way you want to do it. The amount, of, the amount that we film. Y well, yeah, like how much like uh, 
firm do you have to, to use? Um, we never have enough, which okay. is which is yeah. the perfect amount. You know, if we're because <laughs> then you have to just cut stuff, and you think, well, we've got a few, we've got like. 200 feet left today, we're going to have to cut this. So instead of doing the scene in seven shots, we're going to work out how to do it in three shots. And it's all, I, I think, is always for the better. It makes the edit easier. <laughs> and like, you know, genuinely makes the edit easier in two ways. One, you've got less footage to review. And two, I quite often get in the edit and the scene doesn't work because I haven't shot enough. I never shoot coverage. I never shoot a safety wide. I just shoot the shots that I see in my head when I plan the film. So I imagine the film in my head and then I write a shot list, and then we shoot that, and then when I get in the edit, it turns out I didn't imagine all of the shots I needed. <laughs> and then I have to, and that's when I work with the- That's with when the you put a slug in, or? That's when I get a slug, or, <laughs> or get a freeze frame. You just stick a freeze frame in, and then afterwards people go, oh, the freeze frame, that means this, this, and this. And I go, yes, it does. <laughs> Planned all along. Yeah, but, but I like that sort of kind of self-sabotaging where you have to, because I, I think the film's made in the edit, you know, you, the old cliche goes, you make the film three times, you make it when you write it, you make it when you shoot it, and you make it when, it, when you edit it. The, actual, the, one when you, the, the film you make when you edit it is the only one that matters, because it's the only one the audience sees. So the more... Well, I mean, it matters for you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well yeah. I mean, yeah, I well, and it matters uh, as an actor to, to see the, s the script and read the script and then oh, see yeah. the finished product and go, well, oh, that's nothing like I read in the first time. Yeah, of course. But I mean, if, if it wasn't a film, you know, if we didn't have editing, we, uh, we'd do it as theatre. And if we didn't have shooting, I'd, you know, I'd do it as a, as a short story. You know, editing is the end point. Editing is where is the version that everybody's seen, you know. So I like, and, and I think film for me is... You have a shoot in the middle, and either side of the shoot, you have two editing processes. And the writing is editing. You're editing with hypothetical footage. And the edit is editing, and you're editing with real footage. And that's all, that's all film is. And so the more creative you can get in the edit, the better. Because you know, writing's great, because you can do anything when you're writing. Um, you have limitations like you know getting over procrastination and deadlines and and all of that kind of stuff. But it, everything it's limitless, so it's kind of a I find it a difficult thing to do because when do you know when the script's finished? Because you can always think of something else. You can always or you can always think you're just about to think of something better. Whereas in the edit, I'm there with five hours of rushes for a 91 minute long film, and it's. I've got to make this work out of this footage. And if I haven't got quite what I need to create conventional scenes where the editing is invisible and cutting on action, cutting on movement, and all this kind of stuff, I like that. I like a scene where I haven't quite got enough shots because then I have to kind of rework it and really rely on montage, which is, you know, and play around with time. Going back to what you mentioned earlier, you know, filmmaking is simple. All we do in filmmaking is we capture light and we manipulate time. That's all film is, you know, and, we th and capturing light is the thing that is obvious because that's, that's what we did ever since we invented painting. We've been capturing light and photography is just capturing light. But I don't think, uh, I think it's important to remember that the other half of it is manipulating time. And, and we've got this amazing art form that just exactly syncs with the way we think. You know, we, that's why we had to create cinema, which is the greatest thing the human race ever invented. It sounds frivolous, but it's true. Because we made, and it, it's not about entertainment necessarily, it's about making sense of our dream state. We, we invented an art form. So, and it, we, as soon as it was invented, it was completely familiar. You know, the, the often exaggerated story of the train pulling into the, the Lumiere train pulling into the station, everybody running out screaming because they thought a black and white train was coming through the wall into their color world. <laughs> I can understand why people did that. But then when Ed, the first, in 1903, when Edwin S. Porter cross-cut space and time in the diary of an American fireman, is that the name of it? It's the first time it cross-cut between one location and another location, jumped around in time. The audience didn't run out. They just sat there and went, yep, that's how my mind works, you know? And we were up, you know, and we... You know because you were there. Yeah. Because you <laughs> travel through yeah, yeah. time and space. Yeah, I'm, I'm there in the future. Well, I mean, and that's why the movie also capture time, sense of time so beautifully. Because you, I mean, it's clearly said like 1973, but you move through the time where like the present, the past and the future are all tangled up and moving 
back and forth, so it's disorienting uh, in a way, but it's also captivating the way you can, it gives you so much freedom as a viewer to just like, where am I? Why am I here? Will I go back? And what is happening now? But did it happen before? But yeah, and I think that's the, that's the human, you know, as John Lennon said, be here now. You know, that idea of all we've got is now, but, own, but now is just a construct of what's gone before and what's gone ahead. So all we are is a s the sum part of our experience and our memories of the past and our hopes and dreams of the future. And, we, and that's, how, that's why we're such complex beings, you know? And we've got cinema to, to, to be able to communicate that. So I'm very interested in the capturing light element of filmmaking, you know, operating the camera you'd have to tear the camera out of my cold, dead hands. <laughs> but manipulating... Did you try? <laughs> <laughs> I will try. <laughs> <laughs> but the manipulating time is the bit that's really exciting. You know, the past, present and future all, all being the same thing. Well, it, it is in a way. Um, but so you, you do a lot on the film because you, you shoot um, as well. And you, it's a small crew where everybody is involved in many different task uh, and you're also very conscious and it's something that reflects on the film and the way you work it's the carbon footprint of making a film and what an ecological film could be because it's very sparse but you also work in a very sparse way and you live your life also this way so it's really in continuity all around so is it something that you both can talk about a little bit um yeah i mean <laughs> I don't know how to say this without saying sounding terrible, but like there's yeah there's it, it, the carbon footprint is is small. There's there's no luxury, you know. I haven't got a nice whinny to go and settle down in and get nice and warm. It is all. And we rode here <laughs> from the UK, <laughs> so we don't take aeroplanes. We took a little boat. <laughs> yes, yeah, but it. Um, it just makes sense. It's just the easiest and the best way for us to do it, I think. Yeah, I mean, it is quite difficult to answer because it is, without meaning to sound like, you know, really worthy hippies, it is the way <laughs> we live. And it's not a conscious thing. It's just we, we're on a little bit of rock that sticks out into the, into the Atlantic. And we're, in it, we're quite self-sufficient. And, you know, that, I don't mean we've all got solar panels and wind turbines and stuff, but we all sort of rely on each other to work. The team's really small, if it, it, and I've been asked a lot because you know Mary's obviously my partner in in life as well as on this film. You know how that works on on the set. You know bringing domestic life, the personal life, to a professional project, but it's it's not a massive deal because the ho the crew, which is very small, is they're either a, like our our best friends or they're literally our family. So the whole thing is personal and and professional. And so there's, and, and the whole film, you know, the, the film's, the film's not really shot on an island. You know. What? Yeah. <laughs> the film's just shot sort of on the moorland, out, out the back of our house, really. That's where, that's where we live. So it's very much sort of, you know. And, and I remember... It's, it's a stone island. Yeah. Where well, the wide shot is in Wales, but all of the, the actual composite of the island is, is around us. But it's, you know, I, I never thought about the ecological side of the way we work at all, because it's just, it is but just the way we work. Until know, the producer... It's totally linked to what you're showing, too. Like, you can't make a movie like this and just waste things. No, well, look, now you've said it, obviously I'm not now going <laughs> to say that in future <laughs> Q&As. But I didn't... The only time I ever thought this is a sort of ecologically sound production was when we... when the day the green we had a green generator so we've got petrol generator in the film but the actual generator we used to power the lights was a was an eco generator and so it's just this, like this massive battery yeah. and Denzel the producer was like yep yeah, we're using this eco generator and everybody was like yeah that's amazing that's really and great it was and silent obviously as well and um but it, to push it? <laughs> no but it weighed honestly it weighed about 300 tons <laughs> and we've got this crew who you know, there was only sort of eight or 12 on the crew. So everybody on the crew, every time the generator had to move, everybody had to, had to move it. <laughs> and we put it. And then we put it in a van to move it, and then the van just like sunk. Oh and then we had to get a, a farmer to bring his tractor down, drag the, 
van out and then we had to carry the generator again and everybody was like, yeah, great, we're doing an ecologically sound film. <laughs> <laughs> You can definitely put this in the extra for the uh, director's skirt of the Blu-ray. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, we should take a few audience questions uh, because I'm sure people have questions for you. And this Do we have a microphone? Yes. So there's a microphone. There's a microphone coming to you. It's quite it is quite nerve wracking because <laughs> you know you can only do it once, um, and like you say, if you're doing a theatre performance, it can change and it can change, you know, nightly. But also that's often to do with um, reacting to another person. So sometimes if somebody else says something different, you'll you'll react to that. So as most of this was sort of on my own, um, uh, I just I suppose. There was just quite a lot of thinking about everything <laughs> before we did it. And we, but we generally didn't, I don't think we rehearsed that much, did we? I think we'd sort of talk about stuff in the morning, um, but we didn't really, you know, there wasn't a point where Mark would sort of sit me down and go, right, in this scene, this is what, you know, sometimes there was, but generally it kind of, it was quite simply done and, and that, you know, and sometimes I'd say, what's going on here? And he'd go, I'm not telling you. <laughs> And I'd have to, and I'd, and he'd say, I want, he'd, and he'd just say, I want, I want you to work that out for yourself. So there was, there was a lot of, of thinking going on. But um, so some of it I felt I had to prep a lot for in terms of my kind of emotional journey and some of it, like the walking and the thinking while I was walking, that, that was all quite, that was all quite uh, comfortable for me, really. And actually, I was thinking about this earlier on, that was my chance for my physicality, I suppose, because um, she's very confident in the landscape and really uh, at ease walking in all of those different sort of environments. Um, so that was the chance for the sort of the physical, as a physical performer, to, to kind of come out. Um, and then all the, you know, in, in the same way that it's shot with the, the micro, tiny, tiny stuff that's going on with the, the with the lichen and the, you know, bugs and stuff. You've also got the macro. So my my big walking scenes were the macro for me, and then the the micro was like all the little bugs and stuff. So. So yeah, I did have to do a bit of thinking. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of thinking. A lot, no, of just lot. a little bit. <laughs> Take credit for it. Yes, thank like, you. Mark is taking credit for. Yeah, that's true. Many new things from the Q and A. So. <laughs> Uh, there's you. a question here. Well, I'll, I'll start and um, Mark can go on. Um, <laughs> go on, go on a bit after me. Um, I uh, I remember the 70s um, and I was a, you know, I was six in 73. Is that right? Yeah, I was six and seventy-three, and um, and I love, I love the colours of the seventies. I love, it was. I was quite disappointed that my costume. I didn't have more kind of browns and things going on in the costume. It was a very practical costume, um, obviously. Um, but all of my, I love. This is a nineteen seventies dress that belonged to my mum, um, and because that's kind of in terms of fashion. I, I know we're not talking about fashion particularly, but. That's what I remember. I think that's when I became first aware of what my mum was wearing and what I saw around me. So I love the 70s. And I also grew up watching all the really weird, in, a, in England we had so many weird children's television programs made in the 70s that were just, you look at them now and you think, there's no way that they'd make stuff like that. And because and everything has to be explained. And it was all really weird. Oh, and so really disturbing. <laughs> it's like a kids' program. You watch it now, you think that would, that should be an eighteen. Yeah. You know, in yeah. the UK, like the highest. Like <laughs> it's like this is almost a video, a video nasty, and <laughs> we watched this when we were like seven. <laughs> well, I mean, I remember the magic roundabout. We were like, yeah. were we on drugs? <laughs> yes. Yeah, they were yeah. on drugs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
But I mean, the 70s for me, I suppose it's, I, I love all of that, all of the cinema from the, well, not all of the cinema, but I, I love how much was being made in the 70s, how much experimentation w was being done in commercial cinema and, you know, how some of those 70s films now, if they were, were, were out and about, they'd probably be in a sort of experimental sidebar, but they were sort of films that were just coming out every week in the cinema. But also, like what Mary said, the, the British TV at the time in the 70s and so TV films. So, you know, I just think uh, it seems weird kind of putting a film on and saying, you've got to see this in the cinema, and then I'm referencing all this TV stuff. But it really was TV. It was, it was cinema that just was on the television. So that was the big thing for me. The specific 1973 was, was purely... Um, I, I just I loved the way the the numbers the the date 1973 looks and I knew it was going to be seen a lot in the film and I had a really specific idea how it was going to be written in a pen in handwriting and it's and it's a little secret here it's not Mary's hand that writes any of that because I I cast somebody else <laughs> for the hand for the handwriting. So Mary's it was, got beautiful. It was a big budget actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. Well, well it was it was the f it was my first AD. Yeah, and, and he's got nicer hands than me. But <laughs> and I loved the way it was written. But then and then afterwards, people started talking. Or, you know, when when the film was screened in Cannes, people mm -hmm. started saying, "Oh, 1973. It's a it's a reference to Don't Look Now and The Wicker Man that went out as a as a as a double bill." Mm -hmm. And they're the two films that people keep referencing. But that was consciously completely accidental. As was the red coat. No, no, no you planned it. I genuinely didn't know that one. That's but what I cannot not, lie I about. Are you going to say this in the next Q&A? Are you saying this in the next I don't Q &A? think I can even say that in the Q&A because no, okay. it's so it, it's so far from the truth. And but and, and the red, you know, the red coat everybody said, "Oh, it's it, it's it's a homage to, you know, don't look now 1973." And and and, and that uh, that honestly isn't a reference to don't look now. Quick little story. The, the, it was the other way around, the coats. So the coat that she finds down on the rocks was supposed to be red, and she was supposed to find it in the sea, and she was supposed to see it from the island in the sea, and it was just below the surface, and so it looked like blood. And then she pulled it out of the water, and it turned out to be this red, um, mm -hmm. uh, what we call an oil skin that, that fishermen wear and, and um, boatmen wear. Mm -hmm. so, that, so he was going to have the red jacket, Mary was going to have the yellow jacket. So I wanted brown hair, got that. <laughs> yellow jacket and blue jeans that was the look and then just before we were going to shoot I thought oh no I think I'm referencing Charlotte Gansberg in Antichrist <laughs> and I thought wouldn't it be terrible if people thought I was ripping off Lars von Trier and so I said I said we're going to swap it she'll have a red jacket and the, and the boatman will have the yellow jacket and then cut to first day of principal photography and I just overheard somebody saying yeah the red jacket that's a that's a nod to don't look now. And I was like, <laughs> so I ditched, I ditched, well, I ditched this reference that nobody ever would have got to something that's kind of blatantly obvious. There's no way people would have, would have thought about Antichrist. No, exactly. But now everybody yeah. mentions don't look now. I know, but now I'm disappointed because I'm like, oh, it's totally like Lance von Trier, Antichrist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think we have time for a final question. And oh, well, maybe two. The real and imagined folk story, folk folklore. Yeah. Um, in terms of the inspiration for the film, right? Um, yeah, it kind of it really draws on what's around us in Cornwall. So the the significance of May, which I think is probably um, is all over Britain, really. You know, and, and probably wherever wherever people from Europe went to so I don't know if May is May a significant I was probably thing universal it's spring it's rebirth I would imagine so that, that is universal and I'm, I'm sure so May I mean historically May w was spring it was the what do you call it the sap rising yeah. so it's mostly about I mean it's mostly people just getting together and 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 having sex after a, a a cold winter where they didn't see each other but then it's been and then it was kind of re it was rebranded you know, <laughs> as other things. Um, but that's, you know, that was, that's, 
it all builds up to May Day in in the film, which is which is a huge is a huge celebration in in Cornwall, um, and and yeah, and the coming of spring and rebirth and re life and the, and the start of the new cycle. So you know, in a lot of places, May the first of May in Cornwall is is much more significant than than the arbitrary first day of January, which is you know, I mean, what's to look forward to on the first day of January, whereas. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But with May, it's kind of you know it, it, it was to do with this this rebirth, and then more specifically, I mean, there, there's the May children who uh, who sing, who carry the the blackthorn and um, and 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 sing a, a, an ancient May song in the Cornish language, which was, which was actually a, a brand new commissioned ancient May song. So it was it was it was written for the film but um alludes to kind of the ancient the ancient folk songs Cause we, i really didn't want to use an existing folk song because they're so specific to different communities within cornwall that you don't dare sing somebody else's may song let alone put it in a film it's you much know. better to create a new one you have to create a new one else yeah. you you're dead um and then i yeah what else other folklore i mean um the idea of the of the church kind of appropriating much more ancient yeah. sites was something I kind of like, you know, the yeah. putting that up on up on screen. Um, it, we need to make it clear that the song that the preacher sings is a, a song, a sort of tra that is a traditional song. It's really popular in America. Is it? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a uh, well, song I by <laughs> choirs and stuff, because it's, it's about sea, sea men and uh, yes. So that just to make that clear that that one is that is an original that is an old song. Yeah, that's an old hymn. And when I I wanted to I sort of googled different versions of of that hymn and everything, all of the top hits on YouTube were American versions of it. Mm. Very and and kind of bigger country. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but so more, more Wi-Fi. But yeah, <laughs> but ver very religious versions of it. From very religious parts of America. They're waiting for you outside. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're going to take a final question because you you've been raising your hand. Uh. Just sound design. Should we repeat the question? I was I was just uh, paraphrased it by sound design. Oh, so <laughs> no, but you didn't say the bit about saying it was the best Q and A ever. Oh, yes. <laughs> In case you didn't hear all the way in the back. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, oh, me. Um, um, it's, it's really interesting working where you're having to do the sound, you know, post sync the sound. Because, you know, on the day you think, wow, that was, I got that just exactly how I wanted to say it. But of course, it hasn't been recorded. So then you've got to go back a month later and, and stand in a booth. Well, actually, just in Mark's studio with a blanket resting on something over your head and a sort of a duvet wrapped around you. Um, and so sometimes it felt that that felt really tricky <laughs> and you can't believe that any of it works, really. But it does, doesn't it? <laughs> well, it's not for me to say, but it's yeah. Yeah, <coughs> it does. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's great. And, you know, I think actors who haven't gone in and done all of their dialogue Again, haven't had that experience. Get get worried about it, but um, they make it they make it seem very easy. I mean, I don't have to do it, so um, it's easy for me to say it's easy. But you know, you mm. nailed it really quickly. Yeah, <coughs> but I mean, I suppose following on from what I said earlier on, um, as most of it was sort of said out to the wind, um, then that didn't really sort of matter so much. But but the stuff with Ed, actually, we didn't do the dialogue scene together either, did we? No, never. No, so yeah, so Ed and I even recorded that that dialogue scene separately. Um, but actually, th that that worked as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't want you to have. Mm? I don't want you to be able to make independent decisions amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> and but then all of the other sound is. Um, sorry. No, go on. I was going to say you can say your bit now. Thanks. <laughs> but the other. All of the other stuff is, you know, because the camera doesn't record sound, so I don't record any location sound. And quite often I'll go back to the locations 
when I'm editing and pick up sounds that I that I need. But quite often I'll just I'll use stuff that isn't from the same locations because it's a it's an easy way to to abstract reality. If you want to subtly abstract it, then maybe don't put quite the right wind sound on it or don't put quite the right footsteps on it you know and a lot of it I, I do picture and sound editing at the same time so actually at my edit bench where I edit I've also got a piece of fake floor floorboards that I can do footsteps kind of live while I'm cutting stuff and I, also I do the score while I'm doing the picture edit and the sound edit so I've got an analog synth and a quarter inch tape loop that goes around and loops all the sounds and all of that kind of stuff so for me, the, the sound design is one of the best, is one of the most fun parts because I think quite often if, you know, if anybody's made a low budget film, quite often what happens is you go into the sound edit with a load of stuff that you have to start mending to start with because the poor old sound recordist has stuck their hand up at, after a take and gone, can we do that again? Because there was an aeroplane or the, I can hear the fridge and the director or the first AD has gone, no, 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 we got it, move on, fix it in post. And then post comes around and it's the poor sound department who are the first day of this amazing, exciting creative process, they're mending stuff that isn't their fault. And that, I just think that's such a bad starting point for a creative, pr creative process. Um, and having nothing it, I, that's really great, I think, because especially if you think, oh God, I've got, you know, I've got to do 800 footsteps now, and think, oh, maybe if I put a spatial wind over that scene, then we wouldn't hear the footsteps, <laughs> and then suddenly you have a scene. It's like, ah, that I wouldn't have thought of doing that if I'd recorded all of that stuff. So again, it's almost like a, a slight self sabotage to make you think to, to problem solve, you know. Um, the the well-known expression that I always forget about something about limitation being the mother of something. <laughs> mother of mothers of no, not the, the mother's inven invention. Um, yeah. Necessity yeah, is the mother of invention. invention. So yeah. it is the best Q&A because people know what you want to say. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually, I'll answer your questions for you. I always know that phrase until I go to say it and then yeah, it just disappears. Yeah, of course, yes, But sure. I think <laughs> listening, watching it again today, because uh, tonight was only the third time I've seen it, um, and the way the silence is used as well is, is another amazing way of just lifting everything and un unnerving. So we've so there's some quite naturalistic sound and then suddenly there's total silence and you see footsteps walking but there's no sound but and, and I think that's because sound is the silence is the starting point whereas if you've recorded all the location sound you have to you have to actively create silence but the the film's just covered in silence when to, to start with so it's always there as an option so I see I might look at a scene that I'm not considering to be silent but of course it's silent to start with and think actually I don't need much on this maybe I just need a sort of ticking clock or I need the sound of the door and you know it's very, I like, it's very easy to create unease through audio. It's much easier to do it than through picture because if you put, the pictures are really simple. You just look at them and you sort of decode them. So if there's something weird in the picture, you can kind of, you can kind of decode it quickly and make sense of it and yeah, rationalize it. And there, there are exceptions, you know, brilliant filmmakers who do, st there's that film, um, uh, is it Hereditary? Where the, where the where she's up on the up in the ceiling, you know, and that's yeah. that's the masterful shot because you're looking at it, and you s you gradually realise what it is, you know, and mm -hmm. and that's they, but they're kind of uh, one. I, and I wish Harry Astor would be here because he comes a lot here. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, if you see him, it I will it's tell good because <laughs> uh, to do that in a single shot without a cut, that's that's masterful. It's very difficult to do. I don't, uh, you know, I don't think I've ever done it, but the to do it in sound is is kind of easier because you can have a scene where all the sound appears to be realistic but you know in here this in this film there's times where that the clock that ticks never really ticks the same twice and so you kind of I, I hope you know and I, I mean David Lynch is the king of this that you you're watching something and it looks 
normal, you know, it looks real, it looks even like soap opera like, but you're like, what? There's something odd about this. And it's, it will be, he's doing something slightly off with the soundtrack. It will, you'll think it's realistic, but there'll be something a little bit weird. And you'll never get to the bottom of it, but you kind of be sitting forward in your seat going, what is, what is, what is this? And you'll be looking visually, but it's, it's in your ears. And, you know, film's more than 50% sound, especially if you work in a, a low budget level. So, you know, it's much, it's much, it's much cheaper to, to be experimental on the soundtrack than it is to do it on the shoot. Thank you so much, as it was the best Q&A. <laughs> <laughs>